And so one of the things that we're going to explore today is why and how the people of Bourgogne um, managed to continue a thread of curiosity towards how to make the very best example possible of, a tr of wine from the place with the specific set of circumstances that they have. Um, and so that's the really exciting question here. Um, so with that, I'd like to um, begin and we will discover. And so I will posit um, the kind of official marketing frontline of the BIVB or the Bourgogne Wine Board is that that quest is 2000 years old. I would probably argue that this quest is more realistically about 1500 years old, um, but you'll see why I say that as we go along. Um, 1500 to 2000 year old continuous quest. And that's for me why I say that Bourgogne is the mother of all terroir. It's the, it's the mother concept. Um, it, this quest has brought other regions around the world inspiration to seek to understand what they can do throughout the ages and continues to do so. The mother that teaches us how to love wine, Bourgogne, for me anyway. <laughs> Thank you, mother. Uh, so let's go all the way back. Um, let's go back to the geological history just for a minute, <clears throat> and then we'll jump into human history. A little sip of water here. So the basis <clears throat> of, the, of terroir, of course, is the land. Um, then we would couple that, of course, with the grapes that are naturally found there that have been selectioned by people over the centuries. And in Bourgogne, we say we cannot extract the human element or this cultural heritage of people interacting with these natural elements, the grape variety, the variety or varieties, um, and the land itself. So looking back a little bit about what kind of land we have here, we have um, marine sedimentary soils of, of varying composition, ranging from um, very extremely chalky soils, limestone soils, to um, very charged limestone soils, to clay, to marl. And it may seem that um, that's a, a very kind of homogeneous set of, you know, category set. We don't have any volcanic soils or, or, um, or metamorphic soils here, but the way that these soils got broken up and mixed together or the, the nuanced variety of marine sedimentary soils is very, very unique and complex in Bourgogne. And so it begins about, you know, between 200 and 300 million years ago, um, pretty much all of what we know of France now, except a little tip in Brittany and uh, a little bit in, in what is now Roussillon, uh, were covered by a warm shallow sea. And the earth uh, was, at that time, the land on the earth was, um, was a supercontinent or Pangaea that existed from about 300 million, you know, million years ago to about 180 million years ago. And we'll have to go to another lecture to you know, kind of explain that more deeply. But I wanted to just give you mostly this idea of what the Bourguignon people have been working with is this incredible diversity um, on, these, on these slopes. So let's go back to people and the first instance of people in Bourgogne uh, making wine. In fact, there is evidence that the Phoenicians um, were trading wine up the Saone River. Um, we've discovered a very ancient pottery from uh, 3000 years ago that, um, that shows that the Phoenicians and the Etruscans a little bit later were trading with the Gauls or the Celts, right? Um, and many French people or French, um, if you, talk to French people or, or wine scholars and some historians like to theorize that it's unrealistic that the Celts weren't making wine during this time since they would have contacted it. And also because the Celts um, in the about 600 BC invaded Lombardia and Northern Italy. Um, and then eventually many of those people went back to Gaul that they would have brought with them wine, wine technology. But there really isn't evidence of that. So, which is rather surprising, but true that, so it seems that primarily in that first thousand years of wine contact in this area that wine was traded here and possibly not made here. Um, so the first real significant mention of, um, of wine and wine trade comes in the fourth century AD in a speech by the 
page to the Emperor Constantine um, when this page um, Eumenides, when he visits Bourgogne, he uh, describes the land, uh, the vines as existing between the marshes and the canals. Um, and so he's really talking about where the vines are planted and that is not on the hillside. So we'll talk about how the vines got up the hillsides, right? People didn't really realize yet that um, that the hillsides were the best spot. Although we do again have Roman, uh, the Romans start to uh, describe and be curious about terroir and talk about the what the what a slope does for vineyards and what the advantages, especially as they start to plant vines and make wine up farther north in Europe, in um, France and in Germany. The slope becomes very important because it accentuates the sunlight, right? for one of the reasons, um, and of course for drainage. So, but when does the when do the vines really move up the slope in Borgon is the question. Um, and we believe this is in the fifth century AD. Um, so Rome falls and we have um, Northern tribes that descend into this area and mixing with the Celts, because really we believe actually that the area around Borgon is the or origin or birthplace of Celtic culture, which is a culture of, a kind of nomadic people, ancient nomadic people that, that is built around trade and, um, and handcrafts, um, and that this is really the seat of Celtic culture. And so, um, so we have the Celts, then we have, you know, then we have the Mediterranean people that come in, and then here we've got the Germanic tribes coming down from the north. And actually the, the, the Burgundians um, really probably came all the way up from Scandinavia, and they settled down in this area in the fifth century um, AD, and um, really kind of through this connection between the Franks. Um, Clovis marries a Burgundian princess, Clotilda, and, um, or, you know, daughter of a, of a king, um, and they get converted to the Christian faith. So here we've got the Burgundians arriving in Bourgogne, and, um, the, one of the laws of the land at the time was that um, if a piece of land was uncultivated and you cultivated it, that you had ownership of it or rights to it. And because mostly the fertile flatland was cultivated in Bourgogne, um, the, the Burgundians decided that they would plant up on the slopes that weren't taken yet. And so we can thank them for moving the vines up the slopes, which gave the people of Bourgogne the ability to begin, this is why I say that, that this really begins in the fifth century and the sixth century, the quest to understand what that means, what the, what the coats are and why they're kind of the, the terroir essence of, of Bourgogne wines. From the seventh century onward, we see this heavy rise of the church and the, the birth of two important um, orders, which were the Benedictines and the Cistercians. So the Benedictines rose out of um, the order of St. Martin of Tours, who of course he came from Tours in the Loire Valley. And um, after he died in the, um, in the ninth century, his order of monks that later would become the Benedictines put in for a transfer away from the Loire Valley because of Viking invasions and how dangerous the Loire um, invasions in the Loire were. Um, they were transferred to the Saint Germain Abbey, which is um, near Auxerre, very near to Chablis. Um, and so they were given also land um, in and around Chablis, quite a lot of land. And um, this begins um, the influence of the church in Bourgogne. Um, Later in the in 910, the Cluny Abbey, the very very famous Cluny Abbey in the Macon, was established, and uh, the and uh, many abbeys that that um, satellited around both the Saint Germain Abbey and the Cluny Abbey and the monks doing their work um, to ensure stability for for their people and find out how to make the best wines, um, and so really politics and the church. Um, start to work together in this quest to push for quality wines over quantity wines. And in the eighth century, Charlemagne gifts, um, starts to gift land to the church, to the Abbey of Cluny to, and other, um, other orders, um, huge land grants, right? Um, and this begins this, you know, definitely the politics and the church are in bed together in a very deep way for many centuries forward. Um, and linked through land um, ownership and, um, and wine, really. But during this period, um, we see many of the great vineyards that we know today 
the names emerge. And again, if you do have questions, uh, go ahead and put them in the q and I'm happy to answer as we go. Um, so the Clos de Bez is probably is widely considered the um, oldest or the, the first, one of the first names that we still know today to come onto the scene. Um, in the seventh century. Um, and then in the eighth century, of course, during the time of Charlemagne, who, um, you know, who we know really pushed the, the power of the church um, and want through wine, uh, we see many, many more names come into being. So supposedly he gifted um, two very important and many more other important clima to the church. And that was, of course, Corton, Charlemagne and all Charlemagne in in, in the hill of Corton, and Le Caire in Volnay, for just to name a couple, were both supposedly gifted in 775. Um, we see Clovujo, which is established in, um, in 1336, and um, both the Clovujo and the Clos de Bez were monastic uh, properties until the French Revolution, so which changed everything, and we will talk about that too. Mm -hmm. Uh, so 1349, the plague hits Bourgogne and actually wipes out approximately 50% of the population. Um, this is in, in and recorded 50% in the town of Givry in the Côte Chalonnais and, and more and less in other parts of Bourgogne. Um, there were very few people to work the vineyards and virtually no harvest for about almost 15 years. So this was a really difficult time. And during this period, um, something happens actually, a new grape variety is born. This grape variety is called, it appears in the hamlet of Gamay in the Côte de Bonne near Montelly um, and Saint-Aubin. And um, they call the grape Gamay after the hamlet that it's discovered in. And Gamay, as you probably know, is, um, is a child of Pinot Noir. So it has some, shares some similar qualities, but it's much more rustic and especially in this really cool climate in these limestone soils makes a really rustic kind of lean wine. Um, and so of course the church and we're gonna talk about the Dukes in just a minute or these wealthy noble people that were running the show in this era um, don't want Gamay. They don't want Gamay to be the grape. They want, they've already started to select Pinot Noir as the high quality grape that's gonna make this really good wine that's gonna sell in Paris and bring wealth to them, right? Um, and so begins this kind of struggle about Gamay. So Gamay is much more productive. It's much hardier. It can be neglected more and still thrive and make decent wine. So it's really a workhorse in this area. Um, so, Let's talk more about Gamay. So the church and the dukes. We're going to be talking about the Valois dukes, which were a series of four dukes that ruled the Duchy of Bourgogne for a um, little over 100 years. And during this period, Bourgogne was wealthier probably than the church in uh, than the than the crown in Paris actually, or or at least close to it. Um, and so Philip the Bold, who was the first of the Valois dukes, is the in power when Gamay gets discovered. And so he identifies that Gamay is born and comes onto the scene and, and is tricking the peasants and taking them away from this godly quest of making the best wine possible. And so he calls Gamay the bad and disloyal one who has, you know, led these peasants astray. Um, and so he decrees that the bad and disloyal one should be banished from the Côte d'Or. And it is, although to be totally honest, um, many, many, many other politicians throughout the ages continuously banished Gamay from the Côte d'Or. Um, and in 1855, um, yes, 1855, there was still almost 80 per, 85% of plantings in the Côte d'Or were still Gamay. So it really took phylloxera, um, which we'll talk about in a few minutes to actually remove Gamay from, from Bourgogne. Um, so there was a lot of Gamay um, still in the north, um, but eventually Gamay got really pushed down to the Macon, and, um, which of course is part of Bourgogne, but the southern part, and to Beaujolais, where it uh, finds a really happy place in different climate and soils. And believe me, I love Gamay, so I'm not hating on Gamay, but there is a reason for removing it from the Côte d'Or, that's for sure. Um, so... Here we have the Valois Dukes, it's beginning with Philip the Bold, John the Fearless, Philip the Good, whom um, we'll talk about in just a moment, who um, was 
connected with the building of the Hotel de Dieu, the Hospice de Bonn in Bonn, and then Charles the Bold. So these dukes were wealthy through textile industry um, and really um, they were ambassadors and advocates for the wines of Bourgogne. They brought the wines to the popes, they brought the wine to Paris. And so making really high quality wine that could uh, command high enough prices once they got to their markets was very, very important to them. Um, so in 1443, under the rule of Philip, um, Duke Philip the Good, um, Philip the Good had a chancellor. His name was Nicolas Roland. Um, and his Nicolas' wife name was Guigon de Salin, and she's intrinsic in this story as well. Although um, if you go there, they will talk about her, but mostly people talk about men in, in history I should put her name on this slide. So it was really, I think, largely her idea. But Nicolas Roland was, um, was very competitive and always wanted to one up his boss, the Duke, and he was also very wealthy. So um, he and his wife decided to create their own legacy apart from uh, as servants of the of the Duke. And um, during this period of time, we have the Hundred Year War, which is kind of just coming to its tail end. And we've got plagues. So there's a lot of sick and dying people. And so Nicolas and Guigon build the Hotel de Dieu, the Hospice du Bon, which is a hospital, um, to care for the sick and dying, not just their bodies, but their spirits too, because most of the people who arrived there weren't going to make it. So it was a place for the end of life to happen in comfort and peace. And it's really an extraordinary place to visit. And it actually was a hospital, an operating hospital until the 1970s. So uh, now there's a modern hospital nearby um, that's more suitable for medical care. And and, um, and but the auction that's been happening since 1859, the proceeds from the annual auction, which is really you know the thing in Bourgogne um, each year, uh, funds the local hospital that it still exists today. And one interesting thing about the Hospice de Bonne that I think is really wonderful is that um, the Hospice has its first female winemaker, Ludovine Griveau, um, whom I'm going to meet in March. I'm really excited. So. Moving along, as we move into the 16th to the 18th centuries, really Borgon's...